dependent versus independent variables. Let's have a look at an illustration. Suppose we want to know what the relationship is between corporate sales and GDP growth. In this instance, corporate sales growth would be the dependent variable and GDP growth would be the independent variable. In other words, corporate sales is dependent upon what's happening in the broader economy. Now to estimate this relationship between corporate sales and GDP, what we're going to do is we're going to look at some historical data from some sample period. So for example, the analyst may look at the monthly data over the last five years. So this would represent 60 observations. Now using these 60 observations, the analyst would then regress the sales data on the GDP data. And here's a visual depiction of what's going on here. So here's sales, the dependent variable, and here's GDP, that's the independent variable. And each red dot here represents an actual observation. So I know in our example, we're saying we're going to use uh, 60 monthly observations, but just for simplicity, we're just going to have four observations here. It'll be the same if you had 60. Now each dot tells you what sales and GDP were for a particular month. So for example, if we focus in on this dot right here or that observation, uh, this tells you for that particular month, sales was here while GDP was there. So each dot is telling you what's happening between sales and GDP. But of course, the more dots or more observations we have, the clearer the picture that emerges between uh, the relation between sales and GDP. So once we have all these observations plotted out, uh, the next task is to draw a line that best fits through the data. And that's what that blue line there is. So that's your regression line. It's the line of best fit. So what we want to do then is we want to come up with a framework or an equation that represents that line. And really, we're going to be using this regression to estimate, and that's what these hats mean, to estimate what the value of y would be uh, when we're forecasting a particular value for x. In other words, uh, if we assume a particular value for GDP based on this framework, what might be our estimate for sales growth? So to do that, uh, we just use the same framework for the equation of a linear line. So we need the intercept term, so that would be B0 right there. But note again that uh, we're using these hats here. And here's why, ladies and gentlemen, here's why. Because regression only estimates the relationship uh, between sales and GDP. Why is that? Because look at uh, where we got this regression line from. We only used five years worth of data. So basically we're using a sample observations to express the relationship between sales and GDP. The fact is, we don't know what the exact relationship is between sales and GDP. For example, if I tell you what GDP is going to be next year, there's no way someone can tell me precisely what sales will be next year. The best we can do is just form an estimate having used historical observations. So that's the storyline that goes behind this regression analysis. So. Again, let's go back to constructing the equation of that regression line. So we start with B0, or I should say an estimate of that intercept term, because remember, this is just based on a sample. Then we go up a slope, and the slope is measured by beta 1. And then, uh, so let's just suppose we're trying to, we're trying to plot that number. And uh, so you're going up a slope, and then you stop where you get to the value for GDP. In this case, it's the um, independent variable, and there it is. Now the regression represents the average relationship between sales and GDP. It's not always going to give you the exact number. As you can see here, when you draw a line of best fit, what you're going to get is errors. So see that? That's an error. That's an error, right? Because the regression line does not cut through it. In other words, the actual observation was something different. So for example, if we're looking at this x value, the regression would estimate that y uh, would be right here, but the actual observation is right there. So that's why we refer to these as errors. And you can see another error there, and you can see another error there. But here's the thing, ladies and gentlemen, here's the thing. 
Some of those errors are above the line. Some of those errors are below the regression line. So when you average out those errors, their expected value is zero. So yes, there will be errors because the regression is simply a line of best fit, not an exact fit, but best fit. So of course you're going to get actual observations that deviate from the regression line. But on average, those errors are expected to be zero. So there it is, ladies and gentlemen. This here is your regression equation, which is the exact same thing as the equation of a linear line, which I think we all learned back in grade seven. That's all it is. All right, so let's continue. Suppose that the regression estimate is as follows. So uh, sales is equal to two plus 0.6 times GDP. And again, uh, we're just using this regression framework here. So this would be the estimate for the dependent. This is the intercept term. Uh, that's the slope coefficient. And this, of course, is the independent variable. So what observations can we make here? Or what, the, what conclusions can we draw? As I said before, the actual relation between sales and GDP is unknown. For instance, if you're given GDP growth for next year, we would not know exactly what sales growth will be. All we can do is form an estimate. And again, that explains the hat, right? It says this is our estimate. I don't know exactly what sales will be next year, but here's my estimate based on uh, historic observations. And how are you going to form this estimate for sales next year? I'm going to use my regression e equation, which I derived from historical observations. Now, how do you interpret the coefficients? The coefficients are the betas, or the Bs, I should say. So these are your coefficients right there. Well, uh, we said assume that uh, B0 is 2 and b1 is 0.6. So let's interpret that. So what does uh, B0 equal to indicate? If GDP was to equal to zero, sales would be 2%. So let's see if that checks out. So if GDP, if this was uh, zero, what would happen? So 0 0.6 times zero, it'd be zero. So therefore sales growth would only be 2%. So therefore B0 represents the effects of all factors other than GDP. So let's go back to this uh, framework and see what that means. Ladies and gentlemen, ladies and gentlemen, here's sales, right? Now, corporate sales is affected by a lot of factors. For example, it's affected by things like uh, consumer income, uh, exports, imports, exchange rates, interest rates, inflation. But you only have one factor, right? So do you see how this works? So GDP only explains this portion. Well, what, if, what about all those other factors that affect sales, right? Remember we are talking about like consumer income? Where's that? You got it. It's right here. So anything not captured by GDP, or I should say any factor affecting sales other than GDP would be captured in that intercept term. And that's exactly the point we're making here. Well, how about this uh, B1.6? This would indicate that for every 1% increase in GDP, sales will increase by 0.6%. So let's go check it out. And, and again, ladies and gentlemen, this is just uh, nothing more than elementary algebra, right? So if this, if this goes up by 1%, even if you don't know anything about sales in GDP, and actually even if you don't know anything about quads, it's right there. If this goes up by 1%, 1% times 0.6, therefore collectively, uh, sales would go up by 0.6%. So as we indicate, uh, B1 represents the sensitivity of sales uh, to GDP. And that's exactly the point we make here. It's the sensitivity of sales to GDP. Now, how do we estimate the, uh, the coefficients? Right, like I, in my example, in my example, I just said suppose. So I just gave you these values uh, out of thin air. But as an analyst, you would need to compute those estimates. 
So here's where we again have a look at the big picture before we dive into the computations, right? Where are you going to get these numbers from? Bingo, your sample, in other words, your monthly observations over the last five years. So that's what uh, the data is used for to estimate the coefficients. So what are the values for B? Uh, B0, what are the values for B1? That comes from the, the data. So the first coefficient we calculate is actually the slope coefficient. So it's beta 1. And that's, that's your beta. It's just called beta. And the way it's found is it's a covariance between X and Y. So the co-movement between X and Y divided by the variance of the independent variable. And again, what this is doing, you could see it's trying to capture the sensitivity uh, between X and Y. But it's scaling it. It's saying, what is that co-movement relative to the total variance of X? Now, once uh, after you find B1, then you can find B0. And uh, I'm going to show you the ground up approach. So here's our regression estimate. That's the same one we saw previously. And here's an interesting property. When X is at its mean, Y will be at its mean as well. So that's a property of uh, constructing a regression. And I'll just take you to my uh, original graph here just for a second, and I'll show you what I mean. By design, so this is not a coincidence or anything, by design, let's just say that uh, the average value for x was here. So if this was the average value for x, here's what uh, the regression property would be. Then that point would be the average value for y. And that's what we mean. So when x is at its average, y will be at its average at that point in time. So if that's the case, if that's the case, I'm just going to substitute the, um, that individual y with the mean of y. So basically, I'm saying that, well, what if, uh, you know, what if uh, y is at its mean? Then we automatically know that at that point, at that exact point, x is at its mean as well. And uh, so we rearrange the framework over there. But you're trying to solve for b0, okay? b0 is right there, so just isolate it, and that's exactly what I did in that third step. So therefore, b0 is equal to the mean of y minus uh, b1 times the mean of x. Okay. So again, ladies and gentlemen, um, try not to memorize this because you're bound to get a plus or a minus mixed up and that will give you the wrong answer. Instead, just start from the ground floor, which is our original uh, regression framework. Now, when the coefficients are calculated in this manner, the resulting regression uh, first will best fit through the data and two, result in the lowest errors, i.e. deviations from the regression estimate. So these two say the same thing, right? So if, if the line best fits through the data, that means those observations are close as possible to the regression, and therefore the errors would be minimized. Note four. How do we analyze the regression results? Uh, we go in the following order when we're doing the analysis. The first question we ask is, is the regression model valid? So if the errors are picking up a pattern, then the model is not capturing something important, and therefore it's not valid. So I'm going to play a little word association here. Valid, you look straight to the errors. So if you want to see if a model is valid, you look and see how the errors uh, are behaving. Now, a, with a good model, with a valid model, the errors are supposed to be random. But if the errors are picking up a pattern, it means your model is missing something. And here's the framework. Here's the framework. So here's the actual observation for y. And this is the regression framework that we saw previously. And then here's the errors. Now, if 
the regression model is constructed properly, uh, what can you tell me about the errors? Remember, we said the expected value would be zero. And at the same time, there would be random. That's what we said. So on the other hand, if the errors are picking up a pattern, so remember, why is either explained by the regression or the errors? So the first place you look at is the errors. So if the error is picking up a pattern, then you say the regression is missing something. Do you see how easy it was? So you don't actually dive into the regression. You don't even look at the equation. You look at the errors. And you say, well, if this is, again, if the error is picking up something, the model is not picking up something important, so I'm not even going to look at the model. So there it is. Any variation in Y that's not captured by the regression will be reflected in the error. The second thing is, uh, you, so after you determine that the model is valid, then you ask yourself, is the model significant? So there are two different things. Part one says, is it valid? Part two says, is it significant? What does that mean? So, and you got to go in stages. So when you're in stage two here, you're assuming the model is valid, i.e. the expected value of the errors is zero and the errors are random. So once you've satisfied that condition, that's when you say, well, how good is this model? So do you see how it just flows? Once you say the error is okay, then you look at the regression and start kicking the tires, if you will. So what does it mean when we're asking ourselves, is the model significant? In other words, does the model explain a significant portion of the variation in Y? That's the whole point of these models, is we want the model to do a good job of forecasting what the dependent value will be. So I've got two different scenarios here. So here's, a, here's our first scenario, here's our second scenario. And uh, you can see that it's the same regression line. It's the same exact blue line in both cases. But in the first instance, look how close the regression is coming to the actual observations. In other words, the regression is doing a pretty good job of trying to explain the, uh, the actual values. But here, wow, look how far, look how far the regression estimate is from the actual values. So what's the conclusion? In the first scenario, this one here, the relation is significant because the estimates, uh, as represented by the regression line, are coming in close. Whereas in the second scenario, the relation is insignificant uh, because these estimates are far off. And here's the thing, ladies and gentlemen, here's the thing. Just because a model is valid. So in both cases, remember what I said, if you're in stage two, that indicates that both models are valid. But that doesn't mean you're going to start using it to make forecasts. For example, for example, I will use this model to make forecasts because it's proven itself to come pretty close. But the second one over here, well, just because it's valid doesn't mean it's good at forecasting. In fact, this is making a lot of errors, right? So it's insignificant. So I am not going to uh, use that model because it's not significant. It's not doing a good job of explaining what's happening to the actual values. And three, once the model is deemed to be valid and significant, then it may be used to make forecasts.